prose versus poetry that is that apparently, although it's a little bit more complicated than she says in the very beginning of the book, so poetry or prosody as she refers to it, actually is right hemisphere and prose is left hemisphere. But then there's some complicated kinds of fusions of prose and poetry that, that sort of go across hemispheres. But I think that that the question of, you know, poetry and song and what the difference is between that and prose and um, that thought process, I think has some value to, under, to try and delve into that. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, I mean, this started cause I sent you, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about music and, uh, really my thinking about music is very much in line with this, um, that, um, music is a kind of process of, um, constructing nothing and mm -hmm. not the fight, the big nothing that it constructs is its ending. And so you, you start with, with us, with, uh, you know a sequence of sounds and the thing the thing has to breathe and in its breathing it's sort of going through these processes of of um constructing mini nothings until it reaches the big nothing which is when it knows when to stop andrew's laughing but w andrew we also started talking about um constructing nothing yesterday yes and how and does music know when to stop how does music know when to stop how does the story know when it's when it's when it's the end? I mean, Shakespeare kills everybody off, um, but not everybody does that. Not everybody's quite so brutal. Well, and uh, when Agatha Christie too, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Yes, <laughs> it's a little more modern, but yeah. And when I mentioned, I said that you know the Beatles' um, "A Day in the Life" is the only tune I know of that it ends in a huge, big bang, and it yeah, just yeah, keeps yeah. reverberating. I think they were trying to tell us something. <laughs> Yeah, you know this question of you know when does it end or does it end or what are, what are, what are we where is it going what mm. is it telling us? Well, the, the story of the day in the life is a big load of nothing, isn't it? <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I read the news today. Old boy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> How many holes in Blackpool? In, um, Black, Blackburn, in, Lancashire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, the holes are rather small. They had to count them all. <laughs> so now we know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. <laughs> Um, uh, but Peter, if if it works like this, if this if this is if I suppose what we're saying is um, that the the rhythm of these um, forms of expression, like telling a story or in a piece of music, that the the, the rhythm and the breathing is somehow a process of um, balancing things out at different stages of of order. And then you balance one thing out. It's not quite finished yet. So you move on to the next thing. Now, at a metaphorical level, that sounds quite similar to what you say about physics. Mm. But, but also, I suppose what you're saying is that it, the balancing out is not just internal to the thing. It's between the thing and the rest of the universe. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I think, if, I think that's what makes us uncomfortable with so-called experimental novels you know, when they don't follow the, that procedure. Because we expect something, we, we have a certain expectation, don't we, that, uh, that things will end in a certain way. Um, yeah. And if somebody deliberately violates that, it, 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 it you know, whatever we may think, may think it's uh, very clever, but it doesn't really appeal to us somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lobbying closure. for trying to constrain what we talk about. I, I don't feel comfortable with this, but I just thought I, I had suggested, um, I, I was talking about, you know, the Greek aphorism about, you know, man is the measure. And, and maybe now I've come to the realization that the cell is the measure, but that the biologic principle is what really is the focal point. Because without us, what's the, you know, what's the big whoop? <laughs> um, it's all about us, right? Essentially, but my point being that so for me, the huge learning curve in the last 20 years now doing epigenetic research is that in reality, we, in, in the epigenetic mechanism, we never leave the unicellular state. It's constantly going in a cycle from the unicellular state back to the unicellular state. It actually explains why we have to go back to the unicellular state because we never leave it. So that kind of is, I think, analogous or homologous to what we're talking about. The big nothing. Right? Yeah. Okay. I, 
We're trying to re maintain equal poise, right? Yeah. That's the name of the game. So if it's always there, John, is, is what we're, so it's, it's understanding the mechanics of this. Yeah. If, if the unis, unicellular state and every subsequent stage of development is always co-present, that's what we're saying. That's what, is, is that yeah. what we're saying? I think is so. this is this process of um, breathing in our artistic expression or in the, the sort of the just the natural sort of um, pulse of life? Uh, is that the effect of a kind of interference pattern between all of those different processes of all the different levels of organisation occurring at the same time? Yeah. Well, one other. I've been uh, watching uh, David Bone and Krishnamurti for a while now. And um, I just thought I would mention that um, Bohm, Bohm is big on coherence. Mm. He feels that we basically operate in an incoherent state mm. and we fail to, to cohere, but he never tells us what we're cohering to. Yes, so the right. reason I mentioned that is because I think we, we cohere to I mean, you, you and Peter were saying, talking about a carrier wave. We're not really being the right way to express this, but and I have talked about the vector from whatever yeah. the that disruption is that disrupted the singularity. But but the question of you know are the the better we cohere to the principles of or the laws of nature, the better the more easily we manage to remain in equipoise. Yeah. Right? So so this isn't um, I think has just joined us actually. It's, it's, that's the kind of um, um, uh, thing that I'm sure sh uh, she would agree with. Um, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think this is what um, practitioners of mindfulness and all of these, all of these things that, that they would be saying too, that the, somehow you have to, there is a ground state. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think beginner, beginner's mind gets it in the in that idea, but I think what John was saying really struck me is, I think once you become more than unicellular, you start getting trapped in path dependency, so you're not actually able to take care of uh, new situations the way you, the potential you had before. So I, I, it really struck me, John, when you said it, maybe it wasn't your intent, but if we don't go back to uh, the literally in the process, go back to a single cell, uh, we really have lost huge amounts of adaptable potential. So it is the rebirth every time and getting to make new decisions. And then of course, epigenetics is a way to carry some of the wisdom of the past forward. Right, because I mean, uh, for me, the, I understand what you're saying, but the name of the game is to survive. The other aspect of this for me that you know, when, when uh, in the love song of J. Alf Alfred Prufrock, Eliot refers to these claws, he, th he thinks of himself as these two claws scuttling along the bottom of the sea, of the sea which I found, I find interesting because if, I, if, I, if you were to totally reduce the epigenetics of vertebrate um, uh, epigenetics, basically it's just a pair of gonads um, that are dictating behavior estrogen, androgen, in order for the phenotype to interact with its environment to determine whether there's any meaningful change and then to report back to the gonads because that's where that information is processed. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, so, so the behavior is, uh, is critically important because it's what's um, driving the, the phenotype to be inquisitive, to be experimental, uh, to cohere. So uh, I think it can be, you know, in, in that sense, it can, you know, light can be, for us anyway, it can be reduced to that. Um, if, you, if you take your to... poem, which yeah. happens to be my favorite poem on earth, um, uh, it, uh, the poem as I interpret it is about choosing or not choosing, which seems to play right into the idea. <laughs> right. You know, uh, I mean, do you just let the drift of the environment you're in uh, determine what becomes of you, or do you actually dare to change the universe? He says, do I dare disturb the universe? Oh. Is that line, do I dare that's, disturb that's the universe? Question. I mean, every teenager should memorize that poem. Yeah. 
well, and the older I get, the more meaningful it is. <laughs> you know, I think perhaps the more like jail for a proof rock you become. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I read it in high school, and you know, it was like, I don't know, what does he mean by you know, I, I grow old, I grow old, I wear my pants up, grow old, and, you know, um, yeah. But yeah. dare I eat a peach? Still, I don't know what dare I eat a peach means. I still don't know what that means. Well, I have, you know, I have my, my teeth have been, you know, bonded because I've eaten pe peach pits, you know, chewed on peach pits. So ah, I, I see. You can break your teeth if you have bad teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I what about digestion? <laughs> <laughs> so it's poetry, and it, it brings back to what Mal Mark started it. The meaning we got from that poem in many ways surpassed uh, most of the technical learning, the, the meaning that I got yes, from medicine course. versus that poem. If I could only have one, I'd take that poem. Yeah. So what, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> this is when I go to mute. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I mean, what excites me about this whole, this whole discussion and the encounter between John and Peter for me, is that there is such a tantalizing possibility of ask, answering that question or having an answer to that question, which is better than any answer that I've seen from anywhere else. Yes. And that seems really important. And I know, Andrew, we've talked about this as well. Okay. Well, the answer yeah. is that nothing can connect anything to anything else. It's like a universal joint where you have two things that seemingly can't be joined, but you join them with a third thing in this case, nil. Um, so poetry and music and science kind of join in nothing. It's, it's a point of communication. Yeah. So, I mean, Gregory Bateson um, made a great appeal for uh, the way that we go about understanding the world to be more aesthetic. And what he meant was that we, sh we should be more in tune with this aspect of nature uh, which we of course we reject most of the time because we're taught to be scientific and rigorous and all the rest of it and he's, he's got this wonderful line where he gives a, a, a talk to the regents of regents of your university john the regents of the university of california and um uh he says um you know people are torn between rigor and imagination and he says, you know, if everything is rigor, then that basically means paralytic death. And if everything is imagination, it means madness. And you've got to find, you've got to find a way through this. Well, just to, not to push too much of the bone Krishna Murti thing, but I really do think that the two of them were dancing around the whole issue of, um, you know, I think it's I'm pretty sure I, I, I'm writing a paper, I, I meant to look it up, but the, the observer observed thing is a Krishnamurti uh, mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. And I think that what he's saying is that it's one and the same. It's, my, it's what I've been saying about consciousness being one with the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew, as you were saying, that joint point, I think, is where we join with the cosmos, if, if we can. You know, Krishnamurti knocks, has, you know, he says that knowledge gets in the way of that. Thinking gets in the way of that. He's a strong advocate of just a, you know, the blink, uh, um, Gladwell blink, just get in, in touch, be in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the past, the present, the future are all one once you understand that premise. Indeed. But we're not alone in saying this, are we? There are a lot of, um, there's a lot of new agey or um, uh, mindfulness now driven kind of uh, people out there giving talks in management school. Elizabeth will know that uh, everybody in management school in Liverpool is a, a keen mindfulness addict. Um, and is that true? No. <laughs> if only that were true. <laughs> no, I was, I was yes. Um, I think the only thing we're addicted to is instrumentalism, short-term performance, and can it be measured? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> K KPIs, yes. Yes. We have the least idea of anything beyond that. Can yeah. you repeat that? I... <laughs> Just in case my dean didn't hear it from the other side of the uh, 
the county. No, I was saying we're, we're not addicted to mindfulness, we're addicted to measurement and something only has value if it can be ranked. Short term performance, that's all we need. Yeah, that's what Lord Kelvin said. Mark? Sorry? <clears throat> that's what Lord Kelvin said. If you can't measure it, you don't know it. Yeah, I can only understand a thing if I can make a model of it and so on. What, what did he mean then, Peter? Well, he didn't like abstract theorizing. Um, he didn't like Maxwell's theory mm -hmm. because that was purely abstract. And uh, he wanted to make a model of something to, to have a physical representation and to measure it and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Baltimore lectures. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, these, these are positions that people take and they're often... Um, the people who take these positions are, 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 are comparable in terms of their intellectual grasp of the territory that they um, occupy, but they are fundamental differences in personality and, and yeah. personal inclination. Yeah, I mean, they were intellectual peers, Maxwell and Kelvin, but Kelvin took one route and Maxwell took another. Well, Maxwell start, didn't start out doing a, an abstract theory, but he ended up with one. And he said, well, it's still good. Mm. Yeah. So do you think that goes back to, does, can that be traced back to biological origins? I mean, it, obviously it would probably go back to childhood. It's biographical in that sense. Does it go deeper than that, do you think? Um, you know, the, the one's personal viewpoint. Yes. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think it's your development and so on that Peter will determine that. Maybe something that happens to you in earlier life will make you think one way or another. Um, but, but the Kelvin thing is interesting to me because I actually uh, uh, addressed this with um, Bob Hanna, who is not participating anymore, the philosopher. And I, I have always assumed that if you have either an inductive metaphysical perspective or you have an empiric um, perspective and they, are, they, they coincide, that the, the empiric is preferable to the inductive um, uh, metaphysical because it's actually, as Kelvin said, you can measure it. And I think, and I, I've come to the realization in, in my own way of thinking about that, that it's the empiric that allows you to transcend the explicate, you know, Bohm's mm -hmm. explicate and begin to approximate. You never get to the implicate because that's impossible. Mm -hmm. That defies our being. It, we're all about being in that, in that sweet spot between the explicate and the implicate. Mm -hmm. it's, we're, it's an asymptote. But my point is that, and again, it may sound, maybe I'm being self-serving because I'm an empiricist. That's what I've made my living off. But, I, but I've always assumed that it, I made a decision when I first went into undergraduate school, I was not going to be a philosopher. I wanted to be able to go into the laboratory and test the idea and then either support it or refute it and move on. So I'm throwing that out. I mean, is there, is there a hierarchy there? Is, it, is empiricism? Well, well, I can answer my own question. I mean, until, until you know, somebody measured, uh, found the Higgs boson, it was all speculative as to whether it existed or not. You had to show it, right? Yeah. So but that directed where the experimenters looked. I mean, the, I understand. Nobody, I mean, even though it was an outstanding piece of experimental work, the experimenters knew that they were going to find it or, or prove that it didn't exist. They knew that they would get a result on that mm. be, because uh, they knew exactly what to do. Well, I wish that I, you know, had been able to take uh, that couplet about this, you know, the claws scuttling along the bottom, bottom of the seabed and come up with that epigenetic mechanism, but it never would have happened. Mm. You know, there's too much, there's too much distance between those things. They, you know, it's poetry and it's science. Mm. <laughs> but on, on another group um, I uh, attend on, I'm sorry, on Sundays, but, um, this physicist was talking about modern physics um, particle physics, and he comes from an experimental particle physics background. And he was, in a way, complaining about the way that physical concepts are getting further and further away from directly tangible reality. But that does seem to be the nature of the subject. Mm. And uh, there's nothing that one can do about it. That, that seems to the way in which it's drifting. It doesn't mean that you can't do experiments, you can, but when you structuring your theoretical concepts you no longer have things that you can get get hold of like an atom or you, not even that you could get hold of an atom but the concept 
that sounded like something you could get hold of. And nowadays we don't have that any, any longer. We don't have exact particles really existing in space and time. It's all probabilities and, and so on. Okay. And that, that the way it's gone is it's become more and more abstract, necessarily so, and there's no point in, in us complaining about it. We have to go along that path. But okay. it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that we can't do experiment very much so. We can, we still do experiment, it's just um, increasingly difficult to do it, but we still do it. Okay. Could I ask then, um, uh, Colin McGinn, the, the philosopher, this man, um, and other things, said that uh, uh, there are problems in philosophy, like the mind body problem, that we are genetically incapable of understanding. I'm going to have to drop out for a few minutes. Someone's just calling me about a paper, so I'll be back as soon as I can. <laughs> Sorry. Just when I was getting interested. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that, is it... it is it possible there are things that are genetically beyond us? I don't believe so. You think our brain is of a sufficiently general yeah. kind, we can understand anything? I think so, yes. Yeah. Give me a reason. Well, I mean, it's just a hunch. <laughs> I can't give you a reason. <laughs> One cannot prove that. You asked me if I thought that, and that's what I think. Okay, you did. Okay, good, good. I, I, can't, I can't actually say. I can't prove it. I've just got that feeling that we can do it because we always yeah. have done so far. There's never right. been anything that's defeated us, even though we're not, we're not very good scientists. We're bloody awful, really. You know, yeah. if, if we were really good scientists, we would have solved it all long ago. And though, though we're not very good, we're the only scientists that we know of. Okay. <laughs> well, if you go on Krishnamurti, um, if you want to gather, understand, analyze or yeah you can do it in the moment just be here and now and you're one with the cosmos and we fully understand it and that's you know what, what once you said that i mean it's actually if you accept that then we were potentially fantastic scientists well nobody's been able to put that into practice to suddenly solve everything by doing that though the best ideas do come in some sort of way that's intuitive rather than worked out in, in my experience. But I thought, I mean, I had said earlier on that I, I don't mean to push my ideas, but that, that I thought that that's what Einstein was doing when he had that dream when he was 16 years old. But that, I, it didn't give him a theory. He had to do a lot of work before he got a theory. Sure, he had an insight. But, I mean, the, had the, but, but the big insights do come like that in, in my view. Do yeah. we need a theory? Isn't yeah, yeah. the theory limiting? It's too limiting. Ah, yes. Do we need a theory? Well, it, by using a theory, we've been able to construct a different world than we, the one that we originally had. Whether that's good or not, but we have done so. Uh, another quote from Bateson is, uh, to not have a theory is a bad theory. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and you know, and, and Thomas Kuhn in uh, the structure of scientific revolution said that when the paradigm shifts, the language shifts. Mm -hmm. But my point being that the language ha has to be able to create that mindset that allows for the hypothesis. I mean, when you formulate a hypothesis, it's in words. So you've got to have the ability to formulate the hypothesis in, in terms of the language you use. The language will change. And, and I maintain that the, that, that the logic changes as a, as a result. And, and the example I think of is um, rel relativity theory allowing for the Champs, you know, the nude, nude descending the staircase painting or Henry Moore's sculptures with, you know, negative space in them. Um, those things, or, 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 or flashback or, or um, a stream of consciousness, uh, you know, Proust, that nobody, nobody would appreciate that if, if it hadn't been for relativity theory. It, it, yes, you know, um, Kittler, right? the, 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 the German um, media person, says that the idea when you are dying, falling off a cliff, that your life passes before your eyes, reaches us through cinema. And prior to cinema, no one ever had that idea. Mm. Which I think is very odd. It kind of allows us to have a new way to see our own existence. Really? Huh. Um, I could I could give you a reference to that I thought it was, it was, it was a very striking thing. It's a very striking observation. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Huh. 
<laughs> and that in turn comes out of photography with things like Mybridge and these seek and uh, trying to trying to folk make time, which comes out of industry. Um, um, this is in um, Gideon, where the um, mass production, like 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 Taylor and Ford, are trying to cut um, Gilbreth is analyzing movements. Uh, which is which is connected to, so Gil, uh, Gideon says it's connected to, to things in modern art such as cubism. He connects the new descending a, a staircase to Gilbreth, the American um, um, business scientist, the man who did time and motion studies. Oh God, um, yeah, mm -hmm. Taylor. Uh, Gilbreth was a man who had twelve children. He applied his own methods to his domestic environment. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> cheaper, cheaper by the dozen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we okay, were walking, sorry, I, 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 we live we live next next to the largest urban park in America, and uh, we walk there all the time. And there's a river that flows through it, and we're sitting by the river. And my wife looks at me and says, "Look at how the you know you can see the reflection of the trees and the shrubs in the water. That must be where the impressionist artists got their inspiration." And I, I had never thought of it that way. But it's like what you're saying, Andrew, that the artists are, are allowing us that liberty to transcend um, our normal way of thinking. It expands have, our consciousness, right? To have a new idea, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it is very hard to have a new idea. It requires something strange. Where does I it think happen? we need a new idea now. Well, well I think well, we've got one. So where, where does it happen? Where does the new idea happen? We imagine that it happens in our, our heads, but we know that our heads are just full of cells and like the rest of our bodies are. Okay, well, I think you, can, you, can, you can do the mind-body problem next week. I mean, that's... No, 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 but, but, but um, I, I suppose where I'm going is we've talked about ourselves as scientists or mm -hmm. um, the scientific, a scientific sort of motivation. Is this happening at other levels of biological organization? That's, that's the question. So it, does a cell have a theory about its environment? And is somehow our theory about our environment some sort of um, end result of all of those many processes that are going on? Well, I asked the question of, and I don't know if I, I think I asked you, um, Mark, about whether butter, butterflies have caterpillar dreams. Yeah. And I asked that question of a friend of mine, um, and he said, yeah, they do. And he, and he gave me this reference to an experiment that was done in which oh, yes, right. caterpillars were um, exposed to some smell that they, that they liked. And, they were, and, and the experimental group was shocked when they That's were exposed right. to the smell. And then when the butterflies, they became butterflies and they, the butterflies were exposed to the smell, they, you know, they, they freaked out. So they do, butterflies do have caterpillar dreams. Mm. I mean, you know, that sort of by analogy to your, does the cell have a, consciousness of its own it does uh, I yeah think. so I, I i mean this is this is the central hypothesis though this is this is the the nil potency in your cell biology which maybe reaches back into peter's um peter's physics as well and it seems to me this is this is profoundly new and it might give us a um a, a a very different way of looking at some of these phenomena which we tend to look at psychologically but it, tend, it allows us to look at it in a more uh, physiological way but also once you see it in a physiological way you can do different kinds of experiments and I, that's the thing that particularly uh, I'm, I personally I'm interested in. Well just to, re you know, to repeat myself, um, I, I don't know why it took me so long to realize that when, when lipids created formed my cells, primitive cells, they, that was basically Bohm's um, explicate order, which was being created. Hmm. Before that, you had only implicate. All of a sudden, now you have an explicate order as well. But, and the thing that, I, that, that struck me in terms of Bohm and Krishnamurti is that they, they talk about deception, but they don't talk about deception in response to something that preceded deception. And that is that we start out in an ambigu ambiguous state energetically. And that's the key, I think, to understand to what we're talking about, the realization that we start, we start out and remain in an ambiguous state. So for us, Heisenberg makes sense only because of that. Otherwise, yeah. it wouldn't make sense to us, for example. 
So is this, uh, when you talk about the distinction between the implicate and the explicate only occurring at the cell, is that because the cell is the first moment at which the distinction between the implicate and the explicate is made? So right. it's, it is the distinction, the boundary that's created, which kicks right. everything off. Yes. Which is, yeah. you know, from a, a mathematical point of view, this is, this is kind of Spencer Brown, really, isn't it? This is Lou's territory. Okay. Um, so what does Brown say in that regard? Well, so he, he starts by saying, Andrew's the expert on this, but make a distinction. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'd have to, have to read it. The, um, you do have it to The world comes into being, that's what it is. Sorry, I have to, well, there's a famous sentence, at the, which is, we now see it in the first distinction, the mark and the observer are not only interchangeable, but in the form identical. Well, there you go. That is, that's, his, that's his concluding sentence, which is kind of deeply meaningful, but very slippery. Yeah. How does he start? I, I, I actually lent my copy to somebody, and of course it's now not come back. Well, I, I've got a big box of them locked in the uh, university, which of course I can't get in. <laughs> um, so I'm going to I'm gonna have to find a sentence now, so you have to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I was wondering about uh, silence, which I've, you know, Mark, you were asking where new ideas come from. And my research has been taking me to artists. And only when you're deeply, deeply silent, including at a physiological level, uh, can you come up with something completely new. Otherwise, you're up in the head and you're repeating yourself, as it were. So, and there is something physiological about silence, which you find in meditation, of course. Um, so in terms of creativity and new ideas, to me, that's been a very powerful response. Um, yeah. I, I um, won't have much fun to go. I, I, I mean, personally, I find me, creating stillness in music is very interesting because you actually have to do something. You can't just do nothing. You actually have to do something to create stillness. There, there are so many moments in music where time seems to stop that everything seems to stop but it has to be set up you you actually have to construct this moment of nothingness through yeah. doing other things yeah actively stop yes yeah because nature always fills it fills it up so it's a real act of courage and uh, will to create this nothingness well it's it's it, our consciousness can do it and I'm, I suppose the hypothesis is whether that process, that conscious process, is actually all around us at, at lots and lots of levels of organization. It's doing the same thing. That's what's driving its scientific process. Uh, and with all due respect, um, my breakthrough was the coalescing of phylogeny and ontogeny. Mm. So these are two processes that seemingly are distinct from one another, but they're not. They're both yeah. based upon the same cellular communication principle. But my point is that those are two, if, you, if I think of them as like waveforms, mm. when you merge them together, they cancel one another out and all you have left is energy. That, and that's, to me, that's the really important message. But in thinking that just now, I was thinking, well, but now you have, let's say you have a, a unicellular state and it's being exposed to light. Does that cell see light as particle or wave or both? Is it making that call? So it's in a form of silence, to your point, Biko, I think. But it's receiving information. And we know that light is both part particulate and, uh, and waveform. And it's a function of how you, how, what measurement you, you know, the Bohr complementarity idea. Mm. So I've, I've, I've often wondered about that. You know, how does the cell see it? Does it see it as a, can it make that distinction? And if so, how does it do so? Physically, it does both at once. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that, Peter? I, I, so actually, wave particle duality, where does that sit with nilpotent quantum mechanics? How does that work? The fundamental to it, wave particle duality is, in physics, my understanding of wave particle duality is essentially, if you put space and time together in some structure, nilpotency does that among other things mm -hmm. then you then you're sort of 
if you try to do a physical interpretation of it, you find that you've got to either make space time-like or time space-like, and that's your two solutions. Oh yes, of course. Well, yeah, that's right. I understand that. So, so effectively, th th these these fundamental dimensions of space, time, mass, and charge—they're different. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're different dimensionalities within your structure, and they're effectively interchangeable. If you interchange them, you get d different seeming physical yeah. solutions. Yes. But but it's still only one thing that happens. Yeah. Whichever way you play it. And there is there is a logic to the way that those interchangeabilities unfold, presumably as well. Oh yeah, it? completely. We know exactly how we, how to do it. Yes, we know exactly what the relationship is. I mean, there's a very simple relationship between wave and particle duality in fundamental physics. Yeah. Lambda equals h over p. Well, lambda is the wavelength, and p is the momentum. One's a wave, and one's a particle. And they they're connected by the Planck's constant. Okay, so to come back to John's question, so I'm I'm a I'm a um, a lipid, or I've, I form myself into a, some sort of a very primitive cell, and and a, a light hits me. It's both, is it that that I both at once? Yeah, both at once. You you can interpret it any way you like. It will still behave as though it were a particle and behave as though it were a wave. At the same time, they're not exclusive things at all. So my reduction of so the lipids perpendicular to the surface of the wa to the water, and that and that you know it's a it's an amph amphiphile. It's a Twitter ion. So there's a charge that then is being struck by the by the light. Does that make any difference in the way that you just characterized it? No, no. same thing. No, you can you could do the calculations either way. Okay. And uh, in fact, some versions of the calculations, uh, you know, don't distinguish between two different physical mechanisms. And that, that's, that's quite old in, um, in, in optics. Um, Hamilton's way of doing optics was, he, he started off doing particle and then, oh, well, uh, we'll make it wave theory. And he just changed it overnight, he, the same equations. Hamilton did that. Hamilton did, but he... He's not the first dualist, but he's the he's the first that does that gets a mathematical theory which it could be interpreted either way. So where did the dualism between particles and waves where did that start? Particles and waves. It was in the seventeenth century. People were talking about particles and waves with regard to light, not about yeah. particles, yeah, yeah. not about material particles like electrons. They were talking about light in the seventeenth century, and and uh, the first real dualist was Newton who who had two experiments which seemingly contradicted mm -hmm. um, because one was the interference patterns on on uh, Newton's rings yeah. and the other one oh, was Peter is that right did Newton interpret Newton's rings no, as an interference not, pattern no he didn't interpret his interference but he inter interpreted it as periodicity all right okay with you with you periodicity he, he didn't interpret, interpret it as interference. He did understand interference of waterways, but he never applied it to light. Right. But he understood it as periodicity. Right. And at the same time, he had a different experiment with the spectrum in which he passed the light through the second prism and it wasn't altered, which yeah. suggested there was a conservation principle involved, which is characteristic of material particles. So he couldn't get it out of his head the idea that it was some, some sort of particles. But well, having tried every physical theory possible to accommodate these, he, he didn't actually get a particular physical uh, way of describing either using standard wave theory or standard particle theory. And his final theory was a sort of abstract one. And very much like we have now, an abstract way of connecting them. There isn't a, a physical way of connecting them. That's very interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's often presented differently historically, but that's really what happened. And he, he didn't, he, because he was really an abstract thinker, though he was a very powerful empiricist, he was also an abstract thinker. And he was trying to get a theory that explained everything without building a model. 
Um, he never liked building models. He didn't like hypotheses. So he got two abstract positions, which seemingly, you know, are not reconcilable, but that's the final position was some sort of abstract connection between them. And then it was de Broglie in the 20th century who found the P equals H of a lambda, which does reconcile them. Um, just, would it be fair to say, Peter, that your, um, your group structure is effective, what it really means is that ambiguity of um, phenomena in nature is absolutely, is a fundamental property of matter that actually you can always look at things in different ways and get very different kinds of, um, a different perspective. There is a fundamental level of ambiguity in nature, yes, which, uh, which you will always get. Because uh, John, I think this is, you know, this is, this is really central to your, um, yeah. your biological yeah. ontology is that the cell is in an ambiguous state and it's trying to process its way through so where is the ambiguity in physics? The, the fundamental ambiguity. Well, the, the, the fundamental ambiguity is, for example, in the Heisenberg uncertainty is a fundamental ambiguity because you can't fix on position or momentum at the same time. So is that because of the asymmetry of the singularity having been disrupted? Um, I don't really know whether you could say that. I just say that it's, it's a, it's down to fundamental ambiguities in physics itself, which is based on symmetries. And you can take either one side of the symmetry or the other side very often. And, uh, and, and that's where it, it really comes from. A, a lot of the symmetries are due to that. Well, it's like the symmetry between ontology and epistemology. Mm. That's structured, built into physics. Because there are some, or if you like, or implicate and explicate. Mm. That's just built in because... You, you, you can't actually resolve which it is. Right. Yeah. So just yes, quickly, yeah. Um, based upon what I was just saying about the lipids lining mm -hmm. up perpendicular to the surface of the water and having charge, I, I am of the opinion that that is the origin of us standing up erect, uh, okay. bipedal. Mm -hmm. And Belushka, the botanist, the German botanist, says the opposite about plants. We orient upwards, plants orient downwards so, so the roots are actually its brain the the the, the stuff on uh, the above the, the the soil is just a source of energy for it so we're saying the same thing but the thing that's interesting to me is so we're deuterostomes right we develop from the back to the front this part of us is the last thing to be added phylogenetically and ontogenetically and furthermore the vagus the vagal nerve from the back to the front is really what integrates all of our physiology. So there's a structure that actually re, um, fulfills that mission of this directionality. But for example, Meyer, uh, the great evolutionist, Harvard evolutionist said, you cannot relate uh, the ultimate and, and proximate causa uh, causation uh, because they're operating uh, under different principles. I think he was wrong. And the example he used was, was migratory birds. And he said, well, how does that bird know to, to take off and you know, go elsewhere to lay its eggs, blah, blah, blah. Well, because it's got this thing in a, a pineal that's sensitive to ambient light. My point being that you can come full circle here because light is affecting complex organisms just as it's affecting that cell. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which the organism can distinguish photons and waves in some way. And, and I, the, the pineal is the only organ that I know of that has that capacity biochemically to do that. But my point is that I was trying to introduce the idea that we can transcend a unicellular state in terms of this question of ambiguity and light and think of it in, in terms of complex organisms. Yes, it, it's yes. Still, it's still there. It's yes. not still there, it's always, it's omnipresent. So you have this vertical integration. So I'm trying to get this paper written on the evolution of language, starting with mixing oil and water, cellular yeah. communication. The language part, the, our linguistic capacity is, is an evol evolution of that, of that relationship, for example. So you always can go back to the uni unitary state and you always do go back to the unitary state because that's where all of these things originated in that explicate implicate okay. duality. Well would you now allow me to read this thing from Spencer Brown? The sentence I gave you before was the last sentence in the book. 
the other sentence I was looking for was the first one, yeah. which is the theme of this book is that a universe comes into being when a space is severed or taken apart. The skin of a living organism cuts off an outside from an inside. So does the circumference of a circle in a plane. By tracing the way we, re we represent such a severance, we can begin to reconstruct with an accuracy and coverage that appear almost uncanny the basic forms underlying linguistic, mathematical, physical, and biological science, and see how the familiar laws of our own experience follow inexorably from the original act of severance. Yeah. Which is, as, math, as, as, a, as, a, as a beginning to a maths book, it's, it's very biological, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but what's the mark? What, what's the, what is he refer, referring to as, as a mark? Uh, the mark is both the thing that makes the severance and the thing that you see. You can only ever see um, a, a severance is operative. You, you can never see the inside. And then whether we can't see our own insides, I look outwards from my eye. So you're a mark in space. I see the outside of you. But you, um, but you see the inside of yourself. How can I put it? That's very, very confusing. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's our boundary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, from from a godlike view, it's a boundary, yes. But if you're in the mark or outside the mark, we are. Our skin is the. Yeah. Is is our own mark. Yeah. Now I I know one of the criticisms of Spencer Brown might be that perhaps he hasn't. Well, as many. Yeah, um, well, indeed, that perhaps he hasn't um, embraced history, the time dimension, uh, the diachronic dimension in the way that marks are drawn. So it's a, it's a very logical, um, abstract uh, way of presenting stuff. Um, and it's, I think he's probably got a lot in common with the, 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 you know, the systems crowd that obviously he was very mixed up in. They also tend to reduce things to um, logical distinctions which don't necessarily carry history. Yeah. But I wonder if the way we're looking at things, if we're saying that um, nothing is the underlying principle, whether that gives us a way of building in history into this process. Does that make sense? Almost, but not so I can give an immediate answer to it. The, um, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but there is, there is in Spencer Brown, for what for a little is worth, something, an idea that seems to repeat at the creation of a particle, at the creation of a cell, at the creation of a, sense, a sensing human being. But I'll, you know, I'll take what Peter thinks of G. Spencer Brown. You can tell me, tell me to stop it now, Peter. No, no, uh, Spencer Brown's got a lot to offer us. But uh, you know, I don't go on any one individual yeah. viewpoint. One has to use several. Mm. I don't know if this is helpful, but you know, my, my career was basically launched by the, with the ability to, do, uh, to culture cells in little plastic bottles and tubes and stuff. And that's actually how it was a huge breakthrough in 20th century biology because you were able now to take two cell types which we know when you put them together they do good things it's physiology but you take them apart they can't do it any longer and when you put them together um there's something there's, you, you find things that seem to be missing there's sort of this missing piece in the in the in the construct so that's sort of i think getting at nothing you know, without the, the union of these, these cells, there you have nothing. Put them together, you get something, but it's still missing something. And that's, so that's where people, you know, built their careers on finding these growth factors. Uh, you know, uh, Stan Cohen and, uh, what's her name, so discovered the epidermal growth factor. He won the Nobel Prize for that. And these growth factors are really, they're, they're essential to understanding normal physiology and cancer biology. But my point being that, I don't know, I mean, I, in a sense, I think that that's kind of getting at, I mean, it is, it is the history of the, of the organism in a sense, because you, you're, going, you, you're going retrograde in terms of the history of the organism by separating the cells, for example. So you're, going, you're recapitulating the, the history of the organism. So how, how is the growth factor, how, does, how, how is that nothing, or, or how does it contribute to nothing? No, it creates something out of nothing. Oh, okay. Either, either of those two cell types that are critical for 
you know, the alveolus of the lung or the glomerulus of the kidney can do nothing in, in, in isolation. It's only when you put the cells together and they, they communicate that they actually conduct business, the physiology of that tissue or organ. You shouldn't be using them yet. You see, I wonder if there's a logic to this. Um, and I know you've written a book about the logic of biology. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but, um, and it's a different kind of logic to what we, what we typically think of as logic. This is a, this is a diachronic um, temporal process. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I argue, I argue that you, the only way you can get at either biologic or chemical or physical reality is through the diachronic approach, because that eliminates the things that we think are real, the matter, and it gets to the energy flows. Mm -hmm. The energy flows are really where I think the, the, the critical information lies. But we, we don't see it that way because we are material ourselves. And so we just assume, you know, um, uh, in an anthropocentric way that only material things count. Okay. We don't think about the energy. The energy is sort of secondary, right? Yeah. So I, I, you see this interesting thinking about Spencer Brown, sp thinking about Bates and all of these, the, the systems crowd basically who had, they had some important insights, but I just think that we're, we've got something extra here. And um, it may be, I had a discussion with Andrew yesterday about constructivism, because uh, obviously constructivism has been one of the big things that came out of systems thinking. It's had a huge impact on education, on our understanding of psychology, all sorts of things. And it was never entirely clear exactly what was being constructed. I can't see you. And I think my suspicion is, although you can never quite this is why Bateson is a bit frustrating when you read him because you kind of think he's so close to spelling it out and he doesn't quite get there but I I think they couldn't quite get over the fact that perhaps it wasn't stuff that was being constructed it wasn't um, a picture of John or a, a coffee cup or um, a, a telephone that was being constructed it was actually nothing that was being constructed wow what does constructivism mean? Well, that's a very good question. Um, constructivism effectively is a way of explaining knowledge and understanding through processes of communication and particularly through language. It means A makes B makes C makes A. You go in a circle. Yeah. It's self-sustaining. It is coherentist. It's like Spencer Brown, you make this division which makes two things, one sees the other. So it's kind of self-description, self-creation. Mm. Like, um, like, a, like a wave on a string is a, is a constructivist thing. You, you start with a string, then you make this secondary thing, which is the wave. I stopped talking. Yeah. <laughs> now, have you created nothing in stopping talking? Um, well, the wave can go back to nothing. Something can come in and out of, of existence because it's creating itself. It's a self-describing object is how, how I describe yeah, it. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, there are, there, there's a big body of knowledge, a big body of uh, thought in education, particularly Seb knows about this stuff, and we've, we've had many arguments about it. Um, and, and I think, I think there's something that we're saying here which is different, it's new. And I think it is, it is the priority of actually understanding that it's really important to make nothing. I don't remember that it makes any sense. Well, the world is made of nothing. So we're going to apply nil potency to some higher, you know, to the hierarchy through biology up to, up to and including education when you've, when you've got there. Yeah. But why bother? I mean, what's what's the driver? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, just to go back to constructivism, it sounded to me like the mantra about self-referential, self-organizing, self-authoring, which we yeah. use in, in, cell, you know, in biology. Yeah. And nobody's ever really explained that. I, I, no, exactly. And, and yet, you know, we know that there's, there's now experimental evidence that that's true. You know, the yttrium atom 
self associates. That was shown by two separate laboratories about yeah. three years ago now. So there's there's physical evidence for that. But yeah. the question is, well, what? Why does that happen? You know, yeah, no, what is the yeah, no, well, I mean, Sorry, Seb. No, just part part of. I mean, it depends what kind of authors you're looking to. But 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 some would point out that this is not not happening as a as a complete self-referential kind of thing. If you look from a developmental perspective then the first distinctions are actually made in concert with, you know, um, parents or, or other close beings that are engaging you in action. So they are actually arguing very much coming through the language side of things and the, the coordination that is happening through, uh, you know, instructions and shared activity. So it's not just a logical kind of approach that, you know, tries to come up with distinction. That kind of, the differentiation happens Kind of later on, and then I mean, if you take from from Glasersfeld, he was always pointing out that that we kind of miss this uh, differentiation very often because we 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 talk and interact in a way that we are basically running on on each other's expectation, if you want. Yeah? We kind of anticipate what you're doing, what you're saying, and as long as you're not acting in a in a very um, surprising kind of way, I assume a certain level of understanding coordination, whatever it's, is my, is my goal here. But it's uh, the, the, the origin basically is, is a developmental approach happening in a, in a, in a tight uh, um, connection with, uh, you know, within family or group or humanoids doing stuff together, basically. John, just come back to your question of why, why bother? Yeah. So, um, why bother? If uh, the, the, the really important thing, it seems to me, and the thing that's missed is the interconnection between different levels of organization. So the interconnection between the processes that are going on at a cellular level, maybe the processes that are going on at a physical level, and the processes that are going on at a higher, uh, at, at a human level, you know, sophisticated organisms, consciousness, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If those processes are basically operating in the same way so if we can you know we talk about homologies between different levels of um different levels of organization actually it's interesting to think what that means but if if that's the case and if you can make the connections between different levels of organization i would have thought that then i mean this has been your argument as i understand it that we can make uh create the conditions for a new kind of approach to empirical investigation, which can have a bearing on social affairs, on education, on all sorts of, all sorts of other phenomena founded in um, evidence from other, other, other levels of organization. I think that's, that seems to me the, to be the reason why we should do this. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, using the biologic premise as the thing to which everything else yeah. um, relates, because it's only in that Ouroboros moment of the formation of the, that micelle, all of a sudden there's a logic, there is a consciousness matching that of, and it, and it emulates the consciousness of the cosmos ultimately because of the endogenization process, but that's the only thing that makes everything else align, I, yeah. I think. Yeah, so I've been looking at some of the work on epigenetics because obviously um, I've become very interested in epigenetics and as you, you know, I mean, there are lots and lots of papers. There's lots of stuff around epigenetic um, uh, mechanisms, but they, they're all staying at one level of organization. They're all concentrating on the biological mechanism. And I don't see that much work going that's making the connections between these, these different, different org uh, orders with any kind of coherent theory. Right. No, no, no. There, no. There's no one who has sort of taken the, the bird's eye view of, you know, the significance of this. I mean, I, I did write, uh, I did publish a paper in the big history, Journal of Big History, saying that you cannot think about, so this is Daniel Christian, mm. uh, the Australian hist, uh, history professor who teaches history from the Big Bang to the present, mm. and which is very interesting. However, I, I, I made the I st uh, my premise was that you cannot understand big history unless you understand how humans have evolved in the process of 
the rollout of Vic history. They, they are intimately in, in, interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which you see that um, coalescing, that um, merging, if you will, of, of the biology and, and, the, and the history as two pro dependent processes. They cannot be separated ultimately. Yeah, and maybe there are two. There are two aspects of this. On the one hand, there's a scientific coherence that can be established through experiments at different levels of organisation, but also, and maybe this is more fundamental. Look at what we're doing now. We've got people from all sorts of different disciplinary backgrounds, and we're having a very charged conversation between them. Isn't that what we need to be seeing in our universities? Isn't that, and that's only happening because we've all got this hunch that actually. So all of this stuff is connected somehow. Right. Yes. Agreed. So again, my premise was, I mean, if you can have a periodic table of elements and you can have a periodic table of biology that in extrapolating from that, you can have a periodic table of education. Yeah. And I maintain that if it's all about communication and you can reduce it to language, the language will, there, there is a periodicity there from language to literature, prosody, you know, yeah. and, it, and it does, have a certain um, repeat there. There is a there is a recursion there. Yeah. Well, would so, that periodic table not look more like a poem than another set of letters and numbers? I'm just wondering about you know moving in the in the Kuhnian new new language to describe this peri periodic table, which is um, you know it's no longer biology; it's something else. Well, the the way I reduced that was you know go back to the periodic table of elements, there are two, it, it, each element has two characteristics. One is the way it appears, the physical appearance, and the other is the number of protons. So the, uh, the, the proton number, that refers, that's that um, diachronic re reference back to the Big Bang or to stellar evolution. And that explains why the element looks and tastes and feels the way it does. And you can apply that, you can use that same dualism for a periodic table of education as well. You can have a, um, the overt appearance and then what underpins it in a systematic way where you could actually create a hierarchical relation, set of relationships, I think. For example, I don't know, silence and creativity might be connected in some way, or I, I mean, I'm imagining something that we would find two concepts that think, do that work, yeah? I think Peter would say so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just think about the chemistry of a of a sentence. You know, you, yeah. know, you have subject, verb, object. So you have there is that dynamic interrelationship, which could be you know analogized or even homologized to, to physical chemistry. It's, it is the same thing, mm -hmm. and and therefore, since we use language to express the other humanities disciplines, you could. I think, I mean, you could go systematically through each of the disciplines and you could demonstrate how they all derive from that same set of principles. Okay. So yeah. there, is a, there is a powerful reason for saying why bother, I think, or for, for a powerful reason for actually driving this forwards. Um, you mean we, have no, we have no central theory of... We have no central theory, yeah. Yeah, right. and I think if we, if we, I mean, if we go with as uh, this, I mean, this is a hypothesis, but I think it's it feels like a good one. Um, then I suppose the next question is, okay, so what practical things can we do uh, to actually operationalize this? So obviously there are ways of analyzing language. Um, Education. Well, and well. I, Education gives you an opportunity for what you see in education are, are speech acts. You you can see communications. You can see uh, certain other things. The the interesting question is what you can see physiologically. Um, and I suppose, I mean, when I when I sort of first started looking at this, and I know John, you talked a lot about cortisol and um, oxytocin and all the all the uh, the hormones that are produced through physiological processes. Right. Um, but of course, the, the lab work involved in analyzing that stuff is quite involved, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I don't know if you saw it. I actually, you were talking about galvanic resistance yeah. measurement. And yeah. it struck me that you could actually use an Apple Watch. Well, I've, I've got one of these things. and um, Yeah, um, or if it, you know, you could use yeah. that as a derivative of, because you can measure heart rate and you can measure blood pressure. 
changes, yeah. and those yeah. are derivative of, I mean, it's of, of those hormonal determinants. Yeah, and what's interesting is, is actually, it's when you can collapse that, the because di that data comes diachronically. So, uh, you know, the, the heart rate changes over time, and you can look at the patterns in which it changes. You can look at the things that people are doing at those moments. Um, and if you can collapse that diachronic process alongside its, its structural, and analyze its structural properties, then that presumably will map across to other, other physiological things. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, just anecdotally, you know, I think most of us other than Peter, um, and maybe Andrew, you know, and, and Richard, I mean, you know, when you were in math class, you would freak out because it was so, it was so foreign to you. And the problem with that is that, you know, stress, hormones, cortisol, mm -hmm. has to be in a certain sweet spot in order to be able to learn. There is a certain need for stress. But if you transcend that, it wipes all your memory out. That's why it's so hard to learn math, because we, we don't have that capacity. But, but the thing that, that I, that sort of, this is a, maybe this is a crazy idea, but I was thinking about, well, if you, you know, I've, I've raised my own children, I've, you know, I'm involved with my own grandchildren actively. And I thought to myself, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, wouldn't it be cool if we really had that handbook, really had that driver's manual for how to raise a child other than, rather than just doing it differently from the way we were raised, which is, no, which is the normal modality. And in that vein, I thought to myself, well, if, if the educational system is just an extrapolation of what, what parents do with their children, well, no wonder the educational system is in trouble. We don't do parenting very well, really. Going back to stress in math class, yeah. um, I mean, there is something in, in, it's true for education as elsewhere, but the, the right balance, I mean, one of the first principles for in pedagogy would then be stimulation, a good balance between stimulation and relaxation yeah. as opposed to stress and apathy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be one of the first principles. Yes. All Agreed. social organization would, would embrace those principles. Um, that's right. It wouldn't be restricted to education. I mean, our, our, our organizations are stress factories at the moment. Yeah, but isn't that something really important, Mark, to sort of think about? In that there is a difference between education and learning. Mm. And and learning is something that humans do, whereas education is something that humans have decided to do to others. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> yes, exactly right. And we learn throughout our lives, and there's all sorts of you know, if you look at cognitive psychology, all sorts of ideas that we stop learning once we become quite good at something, and so we we actually have atrophy. Atrophy. I've got the word wrong, haven't I? But it, it seems to me that rather education is a social practice, like working is a social practice to an extent, economic practice, etc. But the fundamental human behaviour is learning. Yes. And that's that's the step from cellular biology through to education is that we've actually got to understand humans as learning. Mm. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. It's also part organizational structure. Sorry. <laughs> If you heard the cargo past. <laughs> no. Sorry. Well, everything now is learning and teaching, not teaching and learning, isn't it? Yeah. Because that's the university. They say learning and teaching. Yeah, they but the universities have bastardized it. They've they've they've, they've, they've <laughs> basically they sort of institutionalized learning. So learning yeah. has become education and it's bullshit. Yes. Because it's confusing the two. Yes, that's right. That's right. Because we don't do the learning per se. We do the teaching yeah. and we provide the context for them to learn, whether it's through dialogue or whatever. But it seems to me that what we don't really think about is what's happening for someone when they learn. Yes, that's right. So stress and apathy are, are two relaxation, are two sides of that. But we must learn at a cellular level because in our heads is just a bunch of cells, right? And... Yeah. I don't think we deal with that side of it. We don't think about does, does information visually get processed and understood differently to text? Is that culturally embedded? To what extent is all of that happening at a cellular level in terms of things that we can... <laughs> you're, you're waving something at me while I babble. Yeah, yeah. I was just reading um, Orality and Literature. By How are Robert you? Hong. 
Yeah, so that we, we, we do, we, 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 we speak and we learn visually in completely different ways. Everyone, hmm. that's standard theory, isn't it? Well, and we know that when music plays in films, if you've ever watched a scary film... Yeah, it affects you, yeah, it affects yeah, you. because the music is priming a set of chemical reactions at the end of the day, and I'm way into John's territory, so he could just go, ooh, <laughs> as I make these massive leaps. Yes, and I'm very jealous of people in the music department who can lecture and play the piano at the same time. <laughs> and there's a famous mathematician who always taught through music. But who? <laughs> What's his name? Uh, American. Oh, Tom Lehrer. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't Tom Lehrer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of it. Um, but it seems to me that that's learning. And if we muddle up learning and education too quickly, then we don't get at where that set of mechanisms works its way through up through the structures. So where does inculcation come into that hierarchy? <laughs> it depends on where you live, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, my sense is that at least private school, you know, I don't know, you, you, got, you guys call it public, uh, private, I call it public school education is really inculcation because you're teaching to the test, you're, the stressors are there for metrics. And so I, I think it's more inculcation than, than what I think of as education. I mean, I didn't have a real, I didn't have a true educational experience in my parlance until I got to graduate school. And yeah. I said, here, go to the library, figure out how to formulate a hypothesis, figure out how to test that. You know, you're on your own. It's problem solving. And that's the intermediate between fight and flight, problem solving. That's what makes us human, right? That's what we have to learn. But we don't learn it well in the no. sort of structured system because there's not enough time or will or ability to I mean, I, I'm very concerned with the chemical reactions um, and I think it's a very nice way of putting it uh, I mean I put my students on the mat there, there's no chairs there's no tables we're all sitting on the floor and we're in our bodies and we are learning the theory living the theory breathing the theory because we're doing yoga and meditation as well as a whole lot of other things but the body the, the awareness of what the body goes through and the availability of the body is completely central to my classes. What's the nominal subject of your classes? Then? It's leadership and collective intelligence, embodied leadership and collective intelligence. Venka, can we hire you? We, I think we might have a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> you <call> me that. <laughs> I think uh, private education in England quite often does in fact um, encourage creativity and things because they're very selective on who they take in and it, it's much easier for the teacher to get a good rapport with the students and encourage them to do things. Um, whereas it's not just a matter of wealthy parents saying my children are going to go to this school. Quite. And the one I know best, Winchester, has about a third of the students as a scholarship. And they, they don't pay anything. They just go there on examination. Now, I'm not saying I support this system. I'm just saying that what, have I, what I've observed is that that is a pretty good educational experience mm. for those people who are lucky enough to have it. Mm. Much better than what I had. It's very hard, this, um, because in a way we... Uh, reproduce our own prejudices um, as we think about education and in the process we uh, the system seems to reproduce the class system it does yeah it does. It, I, I don't agree with that at all and uh, but, but what I notice is that you know my career as a scientist would have been much more successful if I'd gone through that yes I know yeah I've heard good think... things about Winchester <laughs> sorry I've heard good things about Winchester what? and I've met artistic very people good. from Winchester yeah I've, I've, I've got a friend who teach, two friends who teach there, and I've quite often been asked to go and give them a talk about things or to, they, they quite often have these um, special occasions where they get a lot of guest people come in and talk about all sorts of things, and they can choose whatever they'd like to go to. Mm. And that, those are really good occasions. Uh, I remember rubbing shoulders with all kinds of other people who were there to teach including people like George Melly, for example. Oh, wow. um, Liverpool man. Yeah, Liverpool man. And uh, so, yeah, it, 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 I don't know about other private schools. The only other one I've got any experience of is Harrow because that's where my friends were taught before. So, um, yeah, 
it is a very good experience for those people who are lucky enough to get it. Mm. But it is very privileged and only a few can do it. But we have a society which has created the conditions where that form of education, it, it almost creates um, a scarcity around that form of education, that those institutions have to create scarcity by uh, restricting entry and having exams and charging huge amounts of money and all the rest of it. Yep. Oh, without a doubt. And, and people are a few years ahead, uh, older than me. I've seen what their careers were. You know, they're Winchester, then Trinity College, Cambridge, then, you know, but picked up by this, by top people in various, they, they go for, uh, uh, to the States for a couple of years and they're mentored by somebody who's quite famous and then they come back. And mm. I mean, I've, I've compared their careers with mine. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean I'm... I went, I went to a private school. Um, I, and I, I don't, how do I feel about that now? Um, I, I have some problems with it, but um, at the same time, I've benefited from it. Yeah. I, I think that's such a good model of education. I'd like it to be more widely used. Yes. The, when there's a, there's a school league table in Britain and Winchester, this is, I'm talking about 12 years ago. Winchester was top and Whittington's Girls' School in Manchester was a top girls' school. And I know that very well as well. That's good. Yes, it's, my sisters went there. And the worst school in Britain is near where you live, Mark. It's next to Manchester University. It was Juicy High. Oh, yes, Juicy, yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Called it doesn't a, even it's exist Britain. anymore. They actually pulled it down. They used to walk down. Yeah. the way to work in Manchester. What? And the students were leaning out the windows. Abusing yes. passers by. <laughs> yeah, well, there's an education for you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that very well. I've been. I've been there a few times. But I can tell you a few stories about what went on in my my quite um, prestigious public school as well. So, um, which school was it, by the way? Lordens. It's where Stephen Hawking went. I, my my physics teacher taught Stephen Hawking. That's my claim to fame. Oh. <laughs> That's what I was a very wondering. Anglo-Saxon kind of discussion. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> No, seriously, I mean, Mark, we talked about it many times. You, you guys always skip over the fact that, you know, Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland works on very different... Exactly. I mean, I don't know, I don't know anyone who, uh, in my circle who went to anything that could, call, uh, could be called a private school. Well, but hang yeah. on, Germany has a very uh, selective education system. I mean, the comprehensive education... Yeah, it, has sec it, it is selective, yeah. but it's selective on, on performance, but it's all public. Yeah, yeah. You really have to search for private we schools. We used to there. have Usually, that as well. We used just, to have that as well. We used to have grammar schools. And that's what people like me went to. Yes. And it was the second best thing to do. Yes. Because you, you, would, boy. Yeah, you would be with your peers. And even in that schools, you were selected um, to, to which class you were in. You were not in. You were not all mixed together. Yeah. Um, that was destroyed deliberately on political grounds and it's and okay. it meant that people like myself didn't get those opportunities yeah that, mm. that i had such as i had but I, beyond I, I, that, sorry beyond that, i mean so for me my experience was that i was in graduate school i was trained by people who actually made major scientific discoveries so they they didn't just have, use tools and know how the tools worked they knew how to think and, how to, and the tools are secondary. So my point being that, you know, it's like going to a chef school and the chef is using, you know, taking this mix, you know, in a box and just put, pouring it into a bowl and mixing it up, as opposed to understanding the first principles of chefery, for example. So that's what you, you need, that kind of, uh, that is transcendent, that is diachronic in the yeah. sense that that person understands principle and understands how to apply it. And so that when somebody asks some oddball question, they know how to connect the dots to whatever that person is thinking about. But, but John, that's, this is, that's what but this is the problem, isn't it? The education is an organizational problem. It comes exactly back to what Elizabeth was saying, that education is something that society, in, well, it creates. Um, mm -hmm. And the part of the reason for creating it is because there aren't that many um, people at the top of their game, and there are a hell of a lot of kids. And so we have to find a way of organizing it. But, but the thing is that what you're missing in your education you pick up on your learning. And I would say 80 or 90% of what I know is from my learning, not from my education. 
but I think that I think what's really interesting is, and Mark and I've had this conversation many, many times in the last few months, and and that's where we've gone from thinking about particularly university education as being training you for a profession. So you learn a set of skills that you then apply, whether it's in medicine or accounting or whatever, in engineering, versus you come to learn systems of logic and how there are different ways of getting at answers. There are different ways of getting at understanding. And somehow or other, we've lost this idea that students should actually be exposed to different systems of logic. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't tell them there is an answer, mm -hmm. but rather there are ways of thinking. Yeah. And I, oh, and no, I think it, along the line, we've lost that so badly. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable. We're still pondering the same questions that the Greeks did 5,000 years ago right yeah. same damn problem and that this is the key to, to my mind is that to un understand how to think mm. that's that's the inherent problem so yeah not only how to think but how to allow others to think yeah. sure. and how to listen yeah yes <laughs> well said so um I, we're probably we should probably stop in a second um i i think it's worth reflecting on how how a confusing and vexing this this question is this whole business of schooling education and whether there is something in what we're talking about here in terms of um, cellular biological processes fundamental physical processes of ambiguity and so on whether there is some core of an idea in that stuff which can help us get something more tractable in some of these questions because it does seem that we've lost our way in so many ways in in uh in social the thing, I, the thing i would offer at this stage is that the thing that makes the most difference is what position you're standing in when you're asking these questions so i got a lot of money and had 20 years to redesign american health care and it took me years to recognize um 2000 to 2003 that there's a fundamental difference between my stance as an internist ER physician and the stance of a person a patient mm -hmm. and that as soon as it, it took me two years solid two years to get to where I could see from their point of view and I got to tell you if we were designing the healthcare system from their point of view we actually know what they want mm -hmm. <laughs> and it would have changed the entire system it would have been really cheap and easy mm -hmm. but it didn't stand to benefit the people who and hospitals and we're so when you're thinking about education the single most important move is to be go back to spencer brown which distinction are you living in <laughs> you know are you dividing it along the educators or the learners and if you can force yourself trick yourself to stay in the position of the learner you'll come up with a much different answer to the problem than you will because most of this conversation as i listen to it is more akin to the i'm not saying your hearts i'm saying what's coming out of your mouths is much more akin to the the administrator physician uh point of view rather than the learner patient point of view and if you can make that shift you'll find really simple cleaner answers you can't put it together the way but, you're but i but i think mark also it is the, the, the issue of position is so difficult. It's almost, it, it's back to that uh, issue of ambiguity that you actually, you don't know where to stand. You can't find a point from where to stand to get any kind of uh, objective view. Well, I don't know. I think, I think Paolo Ferrer was really clear on this. I think it was just one big contribution to the world was that, uh, yes, you're, you're the teacher, but your first job is to be the listener so you learn the language of the other and then miles horton you know is the guy who took it to reality if Ferrer said i wish i had led your life about miles horton's work so he he understood that the, his job was to help people learn how to learn that was it nothing else he didn't teach anything i don't know i've just put a link to you know you said you did this stuff in health i don't know do you know beer did this stuff for uh, the toronto um, health system and he produced a massive diagram. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah, I've, I've linked I to the diagram. Seen, yeah, I think I've seen most of his. his what, work, what's, so interesting, what's so interesting is that he's got healthy people at the center of his system. 
Can you uh, share that picture, John, Mark? Sorry, I put it, I put a link to it in the chat. What's it's a fascinating, it right fascinating diagram. Yeah, I'll put it on screen. Hang on. And Allende, you know, said, oh, you mean the people, you know? So, I mean, yes, uh, I think Beer ultimately got it. Hang on, let me just, this is, this is the picture. So, I um, mean, it's probably a bit small. I don't know if I can, oh, I can make it. So, yeah. Yeah, right at the big, middle of the picture, a population of healthy people. Mm. So I would just change it to an individual because when you do the population piece, you've created a, 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 another. Mm -hmm. So, on the left hand side, he's got all the, all the, uh, I can't move it, sorry. Oh. He's got all the um, systemic stuff. Oh, on the right hand side, he's got all sorts of weird um, self monitoring, self treatment. Um, abusive stuff. Um, it's it's it's. It, this is in the Stafford Bear archive. It's it's a fascinating thing. I had not seen this. That, that's great. I mean, I talk to Elena every week, but I had not seen this. I don't. I, I she I she was with me when we discovered this. So, um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So just that that simple thing will. If you're going to redesign. It was a fluke when we were asked to redesign, given millions of dollars to do it, to redesign American healthcare. A radical person, Mary Minetti, wanted to be the director. I was the executive. And I said, well, I didn't really like Mary, but you know, she wasn't a healthcare person. So I thought that was in her benefit. And so we let her run the thing and she put patients on all the teams. Wow. <laughs> and that changed literally for some of us, it changed our lives, our entire trajectory because we realized how we could never solve the problem we thought we were trying to solve from our own position. So you actually get an idea what the school was like. But Mark, is there, most people understand what they want from healthcare in the sense that they want to be well. They want to be <laughs> free of anxiety and disease and muscles that don't work and a brain that's deteriorating. Like Winchester, but for good. When we think about that for people at different stages of learning, it's sort of the, the dreadful position of the unknown and unknown. Many people don't know what they want to know, but they know they want to know something. I, mean, particularly, well, I just want to comment that also, also you said most people know what they want from health care. We did it. I realize that's a gross simplification. Yeah. yeah, we asked people to draw their health neighborhood and we didn't say health care. And, and the medical system seldom even showed up on the drawing. Mm. So health, which is the purported goal of the healthcare system, which of course it's not, it's money and illness. Yeah. It's what we, oh, what we need and what we produce. Uh, so yeah, again, position matters. And I would say for education, we did the experiment for the high school here where we asked five students over 18 hours, you know, what they wanted to learn is a very interesting uh, artifact that we are <laughs> still working with. Yeah, but the problem is Mark, that in the end, if you do, what is effectively a consultative approach with learners or a consultative approach with patients, you end up reducing the problem just to language. And, and I think that's where we actually need to look deeper than language. We, we, there's the need to look into physiology. There's a need to look into fundamental, the fundamental origins of, um, of language, of people, of systems within society. And I think, I think that's, that's where the work that we're doing or we're sort of moving towards here is perhaps um, maybe able to make a contribution. I, well, I'll just tell you those five students put love and emotions and all these kind of things in it. And it had, I had to remind them at the 18th hour, I had to remind them to put something from mm -hmm. the curriculum in the map because there was not a single thing from the curriculum. And they said, Oh yeah, well, yeah, we might want to know those things. Mm -hmm. So, but this is this is always the problem with with um, the sort of uh, the systems consulting type approaches is that you get we get stuck in language, and it's it's hard it's hard to break out of that really. Yeah, mine was a graph, so the language was a graph. I had them draw graphs. But Mark, to your your issue of something greater than ourselves, I think is the way I would characterize it at this point. Something we're we're sort of nipping it, we're sort of poking at, we're, tr we're trying to triangulate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so in my experience, certainly at Harvard Medical School, there was this huge sea change in attitudes because the students 
they knew a lot of the academic stuff, but they couldn't deal with patients. So all of a sudden they start putting the students in their second year out on the, uh, on the wards. So they actually have hands-on experience. But Mark, you know, the mantra in medicine is see one, do one, teach one, right? And I would submit that even in education, that, that's the same thing. Yeah. You, you are taught by rote and it's synchronic. You don't get that deep dive kind of understanding that is necessary in order to be able to then branch out to each individual student that you deal with in order to personalize education, like we're trying to personalize medicine, if, yeah. if that's even feasible. I'm not sure it is, but I, interesting. Hey. Though, when I look at my medical career, all the learning I did was driven by two different poles. One was just raw curiosity and the other one was ethical terror. You know, so between those two, being chased and, 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 and attracted, uh, I learned everything I needed to know to contextualize the see one, do one, teach one. And that came from me. It didn't come from any teacher I ever met, you know? Right. No, I understand. Yeah, I get that. I, yeah, I, forgot, you, I forgot about that piece about the lit litigious nature of medicine. I mean, that... that no, I, I wasn't litigious. I'm saying the terror was that I might hurt somebody. Oh, okay. It had nothing to do with external. It was all curiosity and fear of hurting another human being were all internal. They had nothing to do with anything other than growing up as a Methodist minister's, you know, in a Methodist minister's household. On well, the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> never, never, never was brought up, not once. Didn't know what it was until after I became a doctor. Oh, really? <laughs> it's all Greek to me, huh? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Question for John, do you know, have you heard of science and non-duality as a movement? Because it's in California that it is present. Science, science and non-duality, it's a community and it organizes annual conferences um, with no. several thousand people. So no, it's, it, it's, they're, they're, no. they're very close to what we're doing here. It's got scientists and people who do mindfulness. And, um, that sounds like NoCal, not SoCal. It's Northern California. I lived in Southern California. Yeah, Northern. It's being somewhat facetious, but it's true. Yeah. The, you know. uh, it's the SAND conferences. It's um, uh, the... Uh, SAND. John, you sent me a... Yeah. John, you sent me a video by Elizabeth Sartouris um, about um, big history. And uh, okay. she, she was talking at this conference. I, it's just I've been attending the, 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 the conference... So I, I'm just, it's very, you know, what's happening here, it happens elsewhere yeah. uh, in some, under some description. Yeah. So it's science and non-duality? Yeah. Okay, I'll look it up. Okay. okay. Um, maybe we should stop and meet again next week. I think I'd, what strikes me this week is um, education is such a thorny subject. And um, because we all bring our own personal experience and personal history to it, it makes it it makes it makes it difficult to deal with. And I suppose the ontological stuff that we're talking about, the stuff which relates to physics and biology, if there is a way in which you can use that to help people to organize themselves more sensibly in terms of education, dealing both with our the structures and processes within our institutions and the way that our learners have meaningful conversations with each other. I think both of those things require a deeper understanding of what's what the, the nature of the world. Um, so I, I don't know whether... Um, you are talking about a paradigm shift. Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah, so I think we are talking about a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, but I think you need, I think we do need to be practically, empirically engaged to do, to affect that paradigm shift. I, I think doing practical things, everyone talks about evidence these days, and actually most of what people talk about as evidence is, is bullshit. Um, um, I mean, you know, there's lots of stuff about evidence-based policy, for example, and um, it, it almost never is. Um, but actually there is evidence that we can gain from scientific investigation, which will have and will can have implications for other forms of organization, other, other, you know, social organization, policy, and so on. And maybe, maybe that's, that's where we need to be pushing a bit. 
I think inviting David Rooney would be nice, but he's in Australia. So yeah, right now it's three o'clock in the morning for him, I think. Yeah. And that, that's another, there's another question about timing. And I'm just wondering, because I've got some Russian colleagues who would be interested in joining us. But uh, again, we're at about two o'clock in the morning for them. And I'm just wondering, could we meet a bit earlier? Uh, I would be happy. Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. I have a different conference call that I'm on. That Which is? Thirty, so that's exactly right timing for me. So, Richard, where are you? You're in New York. <clears throat> I'm in Philadelphia, Eastern New York. Philadelphia. Okay, you're you're you're, you're with. Yeah, right. So I have a ten to eleven thirty Philadelphia time. And breaks just in time to join this one. I wouldn't. Oh, okay. Me. All right. All right. So, well, maybe maybe we stick with this time for now. But um, deal with it for now. I'll help you. In a yeah. Minute. Time time zones are always difficult. Um, but maybe maybe it, next week. Would be helpful uh, to. I, I was just thinking as you were talking. Is it is it would it be helpful for us to try and think of some semblance of some educational experience that has been successful in the in the vein of what we're talking about? I mean, maybe it's just Plato and Socrates. I, you know, I'm just, you know, that's a in long history. read. Pardon? In history, are you talking about? Well, or our own personal it. experience? Yeah, I mean, it can be either now or then or something in between. But is there, has it ever ex occurred in human history that there's been the kind of integrated holistic experience that we're talking about? That's my words, but that's the way I think about it. Well, it's it's I'll be honest with you, I'm finding these meetings one of the most powerful things I've done in education for some time. Oh, okay. And I'm very interested in that. Next no, I hear you. Yeah, got it. Uh, and then on these top voluntary, of that, th These are voluntary meetings and there's no, um, no one's getting paid and no one, um, I mean, Mark uh, and Peter and John, you have a real safe structure to it. But uh, as soon as you start having a, a, a formal leader and start getting paid, education and everything else goes to hell. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Yes, well said that man, yes. Yeah. Teaching is founded on a power relationship which undermines what you're trying to do. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Oh, I've just been uh, reading about the Vice Chancellor of Swansea. Oh God. You know about that. Is this the new thing. vice chancellor of Swansea or the one who yeah, was the old one? The old, the old one. one. Yeah. <laughs> talking about him losing his appeal in April. Right. I hadn't read it before. <laughs> I love it. Vice chancellor lost the appeal. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't go and, the dean, and the dean. Yeah. Brilliant. You know, um, the, the dean of the faculty of management and the vice chancellor. <laughs> but I don't know what he did. <laughs> I don't know what he did. No, I don't think anyone. Well, they brought that. the police in to investigate, so yes. it's obviously something corrupt, isn't it? Yeah. Don't money person. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is what we're up against. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I can think of brilliant teachers in the past. Um, you, you think about the people. It's, it's did always. Did they the teach people. you, or did they inspire you? That would be my question. Sorry. Did they teach you, or did they inspire you? No, it's 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 always inspiration. That, well, I mean, I don't know what, even know what teaching is really beyond that. Not with you, that's my point. <laughs> well, have yeah. inside you. <laughs> so, what's the biology of that? That's that. That's the question for next week, perhaps. What's the biology of that? It's love. I mean, look at Barbara Fredrickson before you come back next no, week. I, I'm 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 not so sold on love. <laughs> I, I look, she made some big mistakes. I, I get that. I'm just talking about on the biology of her work. All right. not, not on her affiliation with the, that crazy uh, business guy. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, maybe that's maybe that's one for next week. The biology of love. Um, Maturana wrote a book about that, but I don't. I don't. Don't think it's very good. But um, why did uh, Mr. Why did Mr. Chip's uh, students love him so much? No, that's an interesting one too. That's the only. That's the character I, yeah. that comes to mind. And would, would he be arrested these days? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's not clear to the least. <laughs> but that's, that's even worse. Some teachers love the little boys too little and some not enough. So that was his... <laughs> Captain Grimes. Remember yes. Captain Grimes in the... Yes. Um, 
decline and fall. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The Catholic Church has some experts on this, allegedly. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're in dodgy territory, but there, uh, there is. Um, I think maybe maybe this is worth exploring, and I think look, looking at it from a looking at it from the scientific perspective that we are discussing uh, would might be productive. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. It's great to see you all. And, uh, and thank you and see you next week. Yeah, see you next week. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye-bye.